Morning in progress. Executing, and then we have to save his state, and then we reload from the PCB one. We were PCB zero, process zero, now process one, and he starts executing. Then he stopped, and we reload this. Now, the actual execution time is this piece, and this piece, and this piece, and this piece. You know, from when he stops until he starts, which you don't exactly see, but that piece there is wasted time, is overhead. That's the cost of multi-programming or multi-processing. So that's the overhead, we call it overhead. Right? Um, and remember we talked about, all right, so far processes have a single thread execution. We consider having multiple program counters per process. In other words, you could have the process is one process. It's got one program. It's got, but it's got multiple program counts. Essentially, the way I think of it is processes within processes, right? Threads are really like small processes within the bigger process. But what does that mean, Tacklus? It means that the other, that the threads are at different places in the program. Whereas if you have lines and lines of the code, you have two program counters, one here and one here. And now, you're going to have to divide your time between the two different threads. Obviously, they're not going to run at the same time. I mean, except that nowadays we have multiple cores. Uh, right? We have you know, a multi-core uh, uh, processor, which means that it can actually run two processes or more at the same time. So that context, I mean, for example, that context is that we talked about before, if you think about it. This context switch that we talked about here. This is all assuming there's one processor. If there'd be two processors, then you have no problem. Um, you just have this guy run and that guy run. You have both of them running at the same time, each one with its own processor. But yet there will still be this concept. That, uh, you know, uh, theoretically, we still have this problem because at a certain point, you've used up all your processors. Even if you have eight processors. You may have nine processes running. So at least somebody's going to have to switch out. You'll always face this issue, no matter how many processes. So we may as well talk about it as though there's just one processor and two processes, right? Because it's, you know, we're always going to come to a certain limit of we have we used up all our processes. But um, oh, so, so in threads, we can have uh, essentially. A mul multi having multiple program counters per process. What does that mean, multiple program counters? That means that the same memory space assigned to it, right? From its member starting at a certain memory location, ending at a certain memory location, uh, because I don't have all the memory because some of the memory is for some other process. But I, in that memory space, I have actually divided it up among two threads. We call them threads, threads of execution. 
but they're still using the same program, but they have different program counters. They're running at different locations and they're using, but they're using the same memory. They don't copy the whole program into another place of memory. You just leave that same one and you have multiple program counters. Um, multiple locations can execute at once, multiple threads of control. Right, those we're executing two different places. Must then have storage for thread details, multiple program counters in the piece. Right, in other words, each thread is going to have to have its own, uh, if you think about it, a TCB. What do you think TCB stands for? Yeah, thread control block, TCB. Each thread is going to now have information about. What? How are multiple threads running? Like multiple locations can execute at once, but isn't that more, like more than one process? Yeah, essentially, it's more than one process. In order for them to execute truly simultaneously, you'll have to have multiple cores. You'll have to have multiple, uh, um, you know, with uh, all the processors. Processors, process, process. But this is talking about with one one core, right? Well, ultimately, you could have it also on one core, which is you'd have that same issue of swapping in and swapping out oh, so among the threads. So you didn't really gain much. The truth is, if you think about it, right, multiple, well, you did gain a little bit. What did you gain? Good question. What do you gain if you have multi threads? If you have one process with many threads, so you can say it's the same thing as having two processes. I can still have to swap them out. I only have one process. So for the different threads, I'm going to have to swap them out and in. So what did I gain? What, or put it like this, what don't I have to swap in and out? Memory? The, I don't do exactly. The memory, well, we didn't, we didn't swap in the whole memory. That was fixed, but we swapped in the memory limits, right? The memory limits, where it starts and where it ends, those at least we don't have to, we don't have to swap out. It's a very small gain, but at least that we wouldn't have to change. Why not? Because they are essentially the same program running. They're, they're, it's, Processes is essentially the same program running. We say threads is essentially one program running, but with two processes, two threads inside the program. So it has the same memory. It's not like a completely one, it's not like one program is calculating pi and the other program is calculating the distance to the nearest star. They're, they're doing the same thing. They're in this, they're the same program. Okay. Um, now here is just an example of a process representation in Linux. I, I, what I did actually in the slides, if you have the book, is I, I removed all the slides that deal with Windows and I just kept the ones that do with Linux. We're actually doing a little Linux. So these are, um, this is just, you don't really have to remember this, but this is a list of data that is kept for each process to help identify it. So the most, first and most obvious thing is the PID, process ID of the, of the process. Another is some is a long, so that's like a long is another kind of integer. Uh, state, you know, state you could just represent it by either you know some number, but it means like whether it's running or whether it's ready, or whether it's uh, waiting. Time slice. I don't know why it says time slice in two words like that. That's weird. That's weird to me. But anyway. Um, Time slice is going to be how much uh, time it gets, maybe. How much time from the CPU it gets. Parent, who is his parent? A list of all of his children is a list, struct list. Who, who is his? Who are his children? In other words, if he create, if he himself created more processes, then they are his children. Um, files, any files that are open and MM, uh, the memory locations for this. So what do we have here? Process information. Right, so this is just, in other words, the, um, the operating system will have to keep like a linked list of these data structures. And he'll keep a pointer pointing to which one he's currently executing, right? As he, as he, change, as he has a context switch. So now I'm executing this one, now this one. And this is, is, this is all of this information. Yeah, well, this is data. Yeah. And we put it into like a box. I and mean, this is that box. And we just, just keep all the information for each process. 
And then as the, and the operating system is, is doing that, the operating system is storing all this information about all the processes. And as he moves from, as he says, okay, now it's your turn to run. Now it's your turn to run. He, he moves his pointer. Um, so we're into this concept of process scheduler, which is uh, the goal of it is to maximize CPU use, quickly switching processes. In other words, we want that overhead that I spoke about before to be as small as possible. So in a sense, we're maximizing CPU use. It sounds bad. Wait a second. We want the CPU to be, you know, we don't want to use it, overuse it. Well, actually, we want to use it fully. The goal is that if, if there's somebody needing CPU, he should get it. So we should fully utilize. The only reason the CPU should be idle is if absolutely nobody wants to do anything. So we want to maximize CPU use. when it, But the CPU could be idle during a context switch. Or, yeah, we'll think about that as we idle. Uh, process scheduler select, you know, it's not really, it's not really um, idle, but it's sort of waiting for, it, it does in small actions and mostly it's waiting for data to transfer. Uh, process scheduler selects among available processes for next execution of the CPU. Right. Now there's, so in the previous slide, we said that we have these, these are the people, the processes that want to get the CPU. So the scheduler will choose who gets the next one. And as it doesn't have to go, this pointer doesn't have to go to the next one and the next one and the next one. It could, it could move in any way we want to. We could choose the next person to get the CPU, the next process to get the CPU any, by any logic we choose. Um, but we do want to maintain a few cues. Because not all the processes are equal in the sense that they're not all interested in getting the CPU, for example. Some processes may be in the middle of waiting for the user to type in his, his, his username or something. Some process might be waiting for what we call I.O. So he doesn't really want the CPU. He's just sitting there waiting for somebody to type CN. You know, he's, they've got a C in line. And he's, so we have what's called this. I think we talked about this. We have what's called a ready queue which is the set of all processes residing in main memory, right? They have their location in memory, they're in memory, but they're not in the registers. The register locations haven't been filled for them. They're not running yet. They're ready and waiting to execute. They are asking for the CPU. Not everybody is there. There could be some processes, like I said, that are out on IO. It's kind of like um, right there. There's in your office at any given time, there's, there's some workers, but some people are out delivering messages. Some people are out doing something. So there's only a finite number of processes that are actually interested in getting the CPU. The job queue is the complete list of all the processes. So in the job queue, there might be some processes that are also in the ready queue, but there might be some processes that are not in the ready queue that are out on errands, out, out to doing CPU work, waiting for CPU. There's also device queue, which is the set of processes waiting for a particular device. Because actually, I could want to write to the screen and you could want to write to the screen. So who gets it first? We're not going to write simultaneously to the screen because then you get like a jumble of what I'm trying to write, what you're trying to write. So we're going to queue it up and work in, in what's called batch. In other words, I get to do, or think of a printer. You don't want a printer that my job and your job are printing at the same time, the printer will, you'll get a page that has nothing to do with what you want. So you have to have, you have to wait online. We call that a queue. And so that's for a device. The printer has a device queue. The, you probably have seen that when you have like, you try to print something and you try to print it six times and then it doesn't print. And then you see your job, your, your jobs, it lists you the printer. And have you ever seen, has anybody seen that? And they try to print like something and then it says you have jobs and you and now now finally the printer wakes up and it starts to print all six of your things that you wanted to print, but you really want to print this one. So then you have to go in and cancel the jobs. So you can go into the printer. So th so that's, that's that's essentially a job queue for for this device, the printer, and you can clear it out. Processes migrate among the various queues. Right. In other words, at one point I might be interested in getting a CPU, or another point I might be interested in the device. In a particular 
So this is just a graphic uh, explanation of what I just said. You just see that um, right here, disk, tape, these are devices, terminals, the screen, tape, another tape. There's nobody wants to use this tape, but there's a, but nobody wants to use this tape, but here, these guys want to use the head and the tail. This is our linked list. You guys all know about linked lists. We have a pointer to the head, one to the tail, and we could work in any way we want. We could go jump to the tail, right? We could start at the head. And the same thing here, head and tail, and here's our PCBs that we showed before. Those, this would be the ready queue, the ones interested in the CPU. These are the processes that are interested in the disk. That's just the same idea, showing you the different queues. A little bit complicated picture. Um, here, this is showing you like this. Here's this ready queue. In, inside of this are obviously all the, that linked list of all the PCBs that want to get the CPU. And some of them get the CPU and then are finished. Right, once they get the CPU, there's a few reasons why they might go back to the ready queue. And here they are listed. This is actually a great question. I should remember that for the exam. What are the reasons to go back onto the ready queue? Which is either, well, let's start what with are the reasons to go back on what? To the ready queue. Oh. That's what's going on here. I got to see, I, I imagine like somebody got, he was on the ready queue and he got CPU. No, wonderful. He's now he's got CPU. Maybe he finished his program. So then he goes, he's done. maybe he didn't finish his program. Why would he stop or put it this way? Why would he better, let's phrase it, why would he go out of the CPU? and go and potentially go back to the ready queue. Well, either because his time slice expired. If his time slice expired, he's been using the CPU too long. So we just stop him and then we stop him in the middle of his work. And then he's gonna go immediately back to the ready queue. So or- is his time what? Time slice written here, time slice expired. You could print these slides and- uh, right No, now. I have it right in front of you. Okay. Um, you IO, IO request. That means he asks for an IO. Now look at this, this is an interesting picture. Because first he says, please give me the IO. And the CPU says, okay, I gotta put you on the queue. Now you're on the queue because there might be somebody ahead of you. Now if the queue, eventually you'll get the IO, that circle, that, that image is like this image, right? He's actually doing the IO here. Now once he finishes the IO, he goes back to the ready queue. Also fork a child. If I create a child, then, well, I don't know what, I don't know that. This is an interesting question, fork a child. Fork a child means to create a child. I created a child process, but I mean, that's you see really that you should have two arrows coming here right if i fork a child now there's the child and there's me so the child executes and i'm not sure about that i don't understand this i don't understand the child executes but maybe a child also has a time slice expiration Slice is just a temporary process at that moment because there's only one line to be added. So if their child process they run through the two lines. Yeah, I don't quite understand the picture. If you fork a child, see so you, you stop you stop getting a CPU because you forked your child. You you lost your CPU because you forked your child. That's what this picture is saying. Um okay. The CPU now the, the, the operator now has to create me a child. But once that child's created now. My child gets my share of, of time slice baby. I don't, I don't think so. I, I should get it. He now should get his own. He, sh he should immediately go to the ready queue. I mean, that, that's sort of true. The child, once I create a child, the child should go to the ready queue. It's, so it's really a picture of like who goes onto the ready queue. The child, who goes onto the ready queue? Somebody who finishes his IO, somebody whose time slice caused him to stop and now he goes onto the ready queue. A new child that gets created will go onto the ready queue and waiting for an interrupt. So I could also lose my CPU because an interrupt came in. In other words, somebody told me stop. 
some external force, you know, Deus ex machina, right? The God from a machine just came out and told me, stop. So I stopped and now the interrupt occurs. Sorry, I, I, sorry, I, I say that right. Waiting for an interrupt. I said to myself, I am not going to proceed until an interrupt comes. That's what that is. And then the interrupt comes. Oh, so now I can proceed. So now I'm back to the ready queue. What does that mean? You're allowed, you're allowed to, there's a command called um, pause. That's the command in Unix. Maybe we'll learn it. There's a command called pause in Unix where you say, I'm not continuing until I get an interrupt. Why, Why would somebody do that? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a better question. Why would I do that? Uh, a process does that? Yeah, process. It depends on the interrupt or it just wants an interrupt. Because then it has to go back from the queue. That's the point. Right. Why would he do that to himself? Um, well, maybe, he's ex maybe he finished a certain task, but he's not finished his program. See, let's say he calculated pi and he's waiting for his parent process to request the information. So he stops himself. And, but he doesn't finish, he doesn't exit the program. So he's not gonna go away from the CPU because he exited. He's just now waiting for the parent to request that information. So the parent sends an interrupt, wakes him up, and then he gives the parent the information because the parent didn't want the information yet. Now he wants the information. Now he finishes, he gave the parent the calculation of pi, and now he does some other calculation. So it's a specific interrupt. Usually it would be a specific interrupt, right? Usually it would be some prearranged interrupt with some other process. But I mean, you know, we're just talking here theoretically. Theoretically, I'm waiting for the interrupt that would stop me from. What, what, what's actually going on in there? There's actually, I'll give you another example. I'll, wait, I'll give you another example. Just a second. Another example of waiting for an interrupt would be it's something called a semaphore. You ever hear of a semaphore? So we're going to talk about that a lot, actually. A semaphore is like, um, you know, on a train. If, if let's say, at the train station, there's lots of tracks, right? But then eventually they all go to one track. And then here's another train station. Now the way, oh, wait a second, yeah. They go to one. And then along the way, there might be something like, uh, like four or side track. There might be something like this. That's kind of the way trains look, work. Most of the way, if I wanna get from New York, I don't know, New York to LA. So most of the way I'll go on a single track. And then at certain points, there's a double track. And then I continue on a single track. But um, what happens is, let's say, uh, Yeah, let's say there's a train over here and I'm coming along here. Now, if I just go right through, we might, we might hit each other. So what's gonna happen is, as this guy approaches this, the first guy to reach this point here, we'll, we say we'll, we'll grab, we'll, we'll close the semaphore. There's he'll close the track. He'll say, I reached here, I got there first. You can't go in. You have to, what's that? Somehow it's a bad drawing, but some, I didn't draw it right somehow, but you have to wait. Well, the truth is he just to go this way and then there's no problem. He has to take a detour. He has to take a detour, but let's say it's not like this. Let's say it's better, let's say it's better. Let's, let's draw a different drawing. Let's say it's like that. That's all it is. When I, I, I <clears throat> um, yeah, at a certain point, I, I told him, now I'm here. When you get to here, you better go up here and wait for me to pass through, and then you can continue on your way. Then you come back down. So there's what we call like a critical section, a certain area where there might be a hit neck shoot. There might be a, a collision. So what we do is we, we sort of lock the, uh, you know, I'll give you my, I'll give you a better example. A better example. 
<laughs> this is where it comes from the word for trains, but I don't know enough about trains. But I do know about bathrooms. So <laughs> I give you an example of a bathroom. Let's say that you have many stalls in the bathroom, and or even just one stall. Now, but the lock is broken, so you don't know what to do. You don't want to. You don't want to interrupt somebody when he's using the bathroom or she's using the bathroom. So what you do is you put like a red towel or a red scarf on the door handle. And whoever goes in takes that red scarf and takes it in with them. So if you come to the door and you see that the scarf is not there, you know somebody's in there. So you don't go in. So you wait. The minute they, of course, you could go in. It's not like physically preventing you from going in, but you have a sign that tells you don't go in. So when they finish, they put the scarf back on the door handle and then you can. Okay. So you think so that's called that's called a mutual or that's called a mutex. Which stands for mutual exclusion. I'm excluding you, and you're excluding me. Whoever grabs the scar first excludes everybody else. There's exclusion going on. So it's, it's also called a semaphore. A semaphore is where there's many, where there's more than one uh, stall, or potentially more than one stall. If you have like six stalls, then what would you do? You'd have six scarves. And if there's one, there's one scarf. I know I can go in to the bathroom. And then if there's no scarves. Then I will put it. So a semaphore is just with multiple scarves, and a mutex is single. So it's a way of locking. But it's an important point that I'm saying, which is that it requires um, cooperation. If I'm just ignoring scarves, then I'll just walk in. It has to be that you attempt to, before you use a resource, which is in this case the bathroom, before you use the resource, you try to grab a lock on it. And if you fail to grab a lock on it, you will wait. And this is where it gets to this example here. Why did I mention all of this? Because I'm trying to explain an example of waiting for an interrupt. What's waiting for an interrupt? What, what happens? I, I get there and there's no scarf bill. So I'm waiting now for an interrupt. For somebody to tell me, I put the scarf back. I'm not wait. How am I waiting? What does it mean I'm waiting? Am I in an infinite loop just spinning around? How do you wait? How would you do a wait in, in C++? You would think, well, I'll do a loop, but then, you know, and then when will you break? You won't know the break. So better is you have a special operator system function called pause, which says, or in this case, lock, it would be called lock, lock for the semaphore, which will automatically block me. It's called a blocking function. It's also an important term to remember. A blocking function means a function that prevents me from continuing on until an interrupt comes. So that's wait for an interrupt is happens when I'm do when I do some function which has the effect of blocking me. For example, taking a semaphore. You know, trying to lock a semaphore is a blocking function. If I don't succeed, either I'll succeed and continue on, or I'll be blocked. There are some functions that are not blocking. Um, uh, there's actually a function for taking a semaphore which is not blocking where you say, try to lock. It's like a function called try and lock. In other words, only if you can lock them, then, then lock it. But if not, then go on, but don't do something else. You know, don't go into the bathroom, do something else, but don't, don't wait. Locking is, is seeing if there's a block function? No, no, no. Locking is an example, is, is a, whenever you try to lock a semaphore, that's an example of a function that is a blocking function. We can define all the functions in the world as either blocking or non-blocking. Blocking functions are functions that do not proceed unless they succeed. That's a good way of saying it. They don't proceed unless they succeed. Whereas, therefore, they cannot fail. They cannot fail. A blocking function cannot fail. It will just wait until it succeeds. It may wait forever, but it never will fail. A non-blocking function will will try to do something and either it'll fail or, not, or it won't. Like for example, if I try to create a process, that is a non-blocking function. Either I'll create successfully a process or the operating system will tell me there's no available memory, you can't create any more processes, it'll fail. But then I'll go to the next line of my code. My code will continue. So therefore, when I, do a, when I try to create a process, I have to check, did I succeed or did I not succeed? But when I try to lock a semaphore, I don't have to check if I succeed or not succeed. I'm not going to, the, the code, if I proceed past that line, it means I succeeded. The, it'll block me until I have success. Wait, so a non-blocking function will never succeed? 
No, a non-blocking function will either succeed or not succeed. A blocking function will either wait or succeed. That's what blocking means. Blocking means waiting. And what's locking a semaphore? Locking a semaphore is my example is taking, is saying, give me that red star. Locking a semaphore means attempting to occupy a certain critical section. Right? Locking or blocking? Can you have like that? No. What? Locking, locking. Well, you can do anything. Remember, every programming question is yeah, yes, yeah, so you can do anything in programming. Yes, you could have priority. You could say that when when the president, in other words, you go to the King David Hotel and you say, Do you have any available rooms? And they say no. You say, Well, if the president of the United States would come, you have room, I say, Yeah. So give me that room. So no, we can't give me that room. That room's for the president of the United States would come. But he's not coming, so give that room. So there could be. Yes, there could be priority. There could be that, like, if a certain girl comes to the bathroom, she gets the, the red towel first. I don't know. Everything is, you know, there's a famous, the, the, the joke is it's just a small question of programming. You can program. Everything is programmable. It's just, you know, program. Okay. What exactly is the one? Yeah, you have a question for uh, ready to process that want to run. Oh, now we're talking about another thing. This is also another very important concept, which we're going to use a lot, which is that processes are either I.O. bound or CPU bound, which, um, which means like, well, here's the definition. If it spends most of its time doing I.O. in many short CPU bursts, then it's I.O. bound. In other words, I.O. is what's holding it back. It's doing, it wants to do lots of I.O., and it wants to get more access to input output devices, screens and things. And it's just, it's, it's uh, and, and the fact that it has to wait for the IO is bounding it, is preventing it from working faster. That's what it means bounding. Bounding means what is preventing it from working faster. IO is preventing it from working faster. It, has, it only has small needs of CPU. So the CPU, the fact it gets enough CPU from the cycling through of the context switches of all the processes. So it, it gets enough CPU, but what's slowing it down is the I.O. because it, it's waiting for people to type and it's waiting for printing onto the screen. And that takes a long time. There's other processes that are CPU bound that spend more time doing CPU computations and very few, very few, very long CPU bursts. I'm oh, sorry, it spends more time doing computations. I don't know why few, very long, whatever. It has, right, few is less important here. The few and the many here. The main point is as long CPU bursts. It wants to use a CPU for long amounts of time. What's going to happen to a process like that? The time slice is going to chop it and stop it in the middle, and it's going to have to wait. And then it wants again CPU, and the time slice is going to come. It wants to use the CPU for an hour, but it's going to have to keep stopping every twenty milliseconds and let other people use the CPU. Because I'm a computer, because I'm a mess in order, but using a queue. For example, let's just say you want our information. You want other stuff that can be done, but your main priority is getting our information. If you have a queue, it's going to be pushed. Oh, it's the back. No, it's the back. What do you want first? Well, if, if once he gets onto the I.O., he'll probably keep other people from using the I.O., right? But in terms of like the CPU, what if you want I.O. to use the CPU the most? Because it keeps on having to go back, get that, get information. It's just, I mean, right, it could be right. Keep on asking the user for numbers and then doing calculations and then numbers. But such a process, if you think about it, what would such a process be? It would be more likely to be an IO bound process because probably he's typing in like a calculator, you know, 75 times 38. It's very quick for him to calculate that, but it takes a long time for the person to type from a computer's perspective because computers doing millions of things a second. So for the person to type, 75 is like eons. So he's mostly waiting for the I.O., such a, such a program. He's mostly waiting for that I.O. to finally finish. Then he gets the CPU, goes, and goes, and he goes, again, he wants to wait. Now what do you want me to do? Do you want me to do one? What numbers do you want to type in? So that would be an I.O. bound process. The CPU bound process, we don't think of them very much, but it would be, well, think about any program that doesn't have any, any C-ins and C-outs. Any program like that, you wouldn't say it's I.O. bound, or it doesn't write to the disk. 
it's just doing some calculation, just, you know, like let's say, what's a good example of a CPU bound process? When I make this video, I uh, up upload it to YouTube and then YouTube processes it. It converts it from a very large file to a very smaller file so it can save space. So that, um, what do I call it? Uh, compression, data compression. It doesn't ask me any information, it just does the data compression. So that's a, that would be a CPU bound process. It has no IO, it's just, you know, or let's say another, well, yeah, we, another example kind of is like watching a movie on your computer. You might say it's IO because it's right to the screen, but the truth is the main thing it's doing is, is, uh, is true, it's right to the screen, but it's also doing a lot of computations because it's taking a compressed file and expanding it as it, as it runs. Um, okay, so that's the IO versus now. Oh, so we have another couple of terms here. We've got to get some actual um, So now we've got the IO bound and the CPU bound. We're going to come back to that. Long term schedule or job schedule. So we have these terms called, so we talked about the scheduler decides which process gets CPU. That's the scheduler. But there's actually more than one scheduler. We could have several schedulers. We could have three schedulers. Long-term, short-term, and what would the other one? Can you guess? Long, short. Medium. <laughs> medium. The midterm or medium-term scheduler. So what is a long-term scheduler? Um, well, let's start with the short-term schedule. That's the easiest that's one. That's the one actually we've been thinking about. The selects which process in the ready queue should be executed next and allocates CPU. That's, that's the schedule that we thought about. Who, the scheduler that takes a process from the ready queue and says you get the CPU. That's the short-term. So that does work in the order of the queue. It works in the order of, well, it doesn't have to be. Again, we're, 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 we're keeping it vague. We didn't say by what mechanism he chooses. It could be he chooses, we're going to see this, something called uh, shortest job first. With the schedule of CPU and does what? Short term schedule selects which process in the ready queue should be executed next in the CPU. Right, and allocates. It. Who gets CPU next? That's what we've been talking about up to now. Basically, what we've been just calling the scheduler is really the short term scheduler. Thinking of a queue, the ready queue very literally isn't the right way of thinking about it. If you think of it as like working like a queue, then you wouldn't need schedules. Whereas you think of it like the schedule. Ah, if you think of it as a simple queue, you're right. A good point. If you think of it as a simple queue, like in a supermarket, then there's no scheduler there. You just the first come, first serve, right? But but there's still that's even that's called a scheduler. This that even that, because remember the processes are not like gonna say now it's my turn. In the, in the supermarket, you say now it's my turn, but the processes are, are not able to do that. The CPU, the operating system needs to say now it's your turn. The operating system needs to do something. It needs to take that process and shove it into memory, you know, and shove the values of the registers from the PCB into the actual registers, the actual hardware, right? Those hardware registers. And that whatever the previous old values were, were stored in the PCB, and now the new values need to be put in. So the scheduler has to do that. It's actually, doesn't just say it's your turn. He actually puts it into the memory because the process can't put itself into memory. You also mentioned that the pointer doesn't go in order necessarily, but jumps around. Yeah, I said, that's what I'm about to say here. We shortest job first. So we have first come, first serve. That's an algorithm that we'll talk about later, which means that would be just the first come, first serve. The first guy in the line gets, the first process gets the CPU. But there's also other ones like shortest job first. I'll just talk about these two for now. But shortest job first means, imagine that I knew how long he wants the CPU for, okay? Imagine I knew that this guy wants it for one millisecond and this guy wants it for 10 milliseconds. So I might say shortest job first. I might say the job in the ready queue that wants it for one millisecond, I'm gonna let him go first. It's kind of like a queue in a supermarket where they, if you have less than 10 items, you can go first, right? That would be a shortest job first. 
Now, the question you should think about is, but how uh, do I know that he only wants one millisecond in the future? What, I have, I'm, a, I'm a prophet, I know the future. I know that this process is gonna want exactly one millisecond. How do I know what he's going to want? Yeah, but I don't know, I haven't read the commands yet. Uh, the program is just sitting there. Uh, how is the operating system supposed to know that this guy wants to calculate pi and take him years? This guy just wants to do one plus one. How is he? He didn't read, he doesn't have to read the code first. That will, that's going to take him the same time as executing the code. So you can't know what, what so what, what's the, well, the only answer to this question is that you make a prediction based on past behavior. In other words, you have this process from before, we, we've already had this process in the queue and he's already executed and he's already going back to the queue and he keeps going in and out of the CPU and we take, keep statistics on him. And we say, every, it seems to me that every time this process wanted the CPU, he seemed to want it for a very short amount of time. You know, three milliseconds. So I'm gonna keep statistics. Like I'll keep a list for him of all the times that he had CPU and I'll to take some kind of weighted average of that. A, a weighted average where I give more weight to the more recent times. Like maybe the first time you wanted one millisecond, now two milliseconds, now three milliseconds, now four milliseconds. So my prediction is that next time he's going to want, you know, around four. I don't know five because I, don't, I can't, I'm not going to make that assumption that it keeps going up, but I'm going to take an average of one, two, three, and four. Or maybe I'll get two, but I'll give more weight to the three and the four. So I'll get maybe three and a half. So I'll get some kind of predicted prediction that he's going to want probably at least three and a half milliseconds of CPU. Whereas another process wanted 100, 300, 100, 400. So I'll make a prediction that the average of 100, 100, 300, 400 is, I don't know, 300 so, or 250. So I'll make that prediction. So I'll assign him a predicted value of how much time he wants CPU. And based on that prediction, I will assign the CPU. Now, now there's a problem with it. I mean, First come first serve is a great system because it's simple and everybody gets a share. This kind of system is unfair to processes that want a lot of CPU. Unfair, what do we do? They don't, they don't have feelings, they don't really care, but what, why do we call it unfair? Well, it's going to be detrimental to what we call throughput. How many processes get finished per hour or per any amount of time, per minute? Which one's throughput. essential? Essential that throughput? No, I'm saying uh, shortest job first will increase our throughput. Our throughput is a measure of how many. Think of it like this: how many? Let's say we measured. Let's say the worker and we get a bonus at the supermarket if if she could handle a hundred client more clients, you know, a minute, but more clients an hour, and we gave a pro, we gave an award to. The, the checkout clerk who did the most customers an hour. So what would everybody, what would all the checkout clerks do? They would tell people, hey, you've got too many items, go to the back of the line. You come here with two items, come in front. And all the time they'd be bringing in the people with short items just to get more throughput, get more people through the line. That's called throughput. So shortest at first will give me more throughput. That's the goal of it. First come first serve means I might get stuck with some guy with three, carts full of food and I only get one guy and take me a whole hour to, to check him out. So first come first serve is not gonna have as good throughput, but you will have other problems with first cut with storage job first. First of all, you need to keep complicated statistics. What other problems you have with shortest job first? What other problems might you have with shortest job first? Right, and, and, and what will that guy, that guy who wants his food, he may have to wait a long time. He may wait so long that he, you know, collapses from hunger in the, in the supermarket. You know, everybody's going in front of him, he just collapses. So we call that starvation. Processes can be starved out. They don't get the CPU that they want. That's called starvation. So we have a term called starvation. We have a term called throughput. We just talked so about. So process is not getting the not getting a CPU in a in, in a reasonable fashion, in potentially infinite, infinitely denied, you know, forever denied. 
because there always is somebody. Like I told you guys, I have that rule. I made up this rule that the supermarket. I let one person go ahead of me. If you have, if somebody says I have two items, can I go ahead of you? Then I say yes. The second person comes and say no. I let somebody. That's it. <laughs> because otherwise, I might be stuck with twelve people going from me. Um, so what's the long term? So that's the short term schedule. I wrote a long sentence here. I, I, I changed this word. Long term schedule. Selects which processes should be brought into the ready queue or left out as waiting as left out as waiting jobs. You can tell that I wrote it because as a lot of the mistake should be as, as a waiting job or as waiting jobs. Um, in other words, remember we talked about we had a slide earlier today where we said that the that there's something called the job queue and something called the ready queue. And we said the job queue is all the jobs, all the processes that want um, CPU. We, oh, in the book, he says, we will use the term job and processes interchangeably, even though they have a slightly different meaning. But I'll use it interchangeably, but you'll sort of sense the use as I use it. But jobs, uh, so you have many, many jobs, but only some of them actually want the CPU. Or some of them are allowed to be on the ready queue. So the long term schedule will essentially say this job, I'm not even going to put him on the ready queue. He wants to be on the ready queue, maybe, but I'm not going to let him go on. He won't even be in the calculation of who the short term scheduler is going to be scheduling now. Why would you do that? Um, so it's because we want to have a good mix of CPU and IO bound processes. We want to have like, we don't want to have too many, because imagine like this, imagine if we did shortest job first, but all the jobs were uh, wanting lots of CPU and no IO. Well, well, first if we wouldn't have a long-term schedule, everybody would be in this in the schedule of Q. Why would we want to take somebody out of the ready queue? Well, maybe we have too many short jobs. And like we like we had that problem. We have shortest job first. And and everybody's come, many, many people are coming with uh, two items to check out, then the guy with three carts will never get serviced. So we may take out some of the short jobs from the ready queue just so the other guy can get serviced, prevent starvation. You can think about we're not gonna we're gonna we can think about when we would want this, but the definition is it selects which process should be brought into the ready queue or left out as waiting jobs. This delay to the entry to the ready queue for the purpose of not having too many of one type of process. What do you mean one type of process? Either I/O bound or CPU bound in the queue, as this can cause CPU or I/O I don't know, say, uh, under. If we have too many, you know. I.O. bound processes, then the CPU will be idle too much. So he, a lot of operating systems do not have this long-term schedule because it's uh, not clear exactly how it can take to um, Here, it says short-term schedule is invoked very frequently. Long-term schedule is invoked infrequently. In other words, occasionally you'll sort of readjust your queue. What does this mean? The long-term schedule controls the degree of multi-programming. <laughs> well, that's that's another. Well, multi-programming means how many programs are competing for the CPU. So if you take people out of the ready queue, then you control the degree of multi-programming. If you take out half the people from the ready queue, then now there's only four processes interested in the CPU, not eight. So you've limited the amount of multi-programming. Um, and, and therefore you have, you know, the, the, each one of the processes that are actually in the ready queue will get more CPU, right? There'll be, there'll be better, uh, you know what it's kind of like, actually, not that you guys ever would go to a, uh, 
a dance bar. But if you go to a dance bar, there's like a guy outside who prevents you from going Bounce. in. Bouncer. And why does he decide? Well, funny. Anyway, the, he has various criteria. One of his criteria for deciding who goes in is how full it is. If, if there's lots of people in there, then he may just want to keep them outside, just keep them out. So why? So the people who are in will get to the bar and get drinks and get served and have the dance floor and have all the, the resources that this bar has, can offer them in a reasonable way. But, so he, so, but there's still inside the bar, a short-term schedule who's deciding who gets a drink next, right? There's a line at the bar, to who gets to serve next, and who gets to dance floor next, whatever. But the, but the bouncer is the long-term schedule. He's saying, I'm gonna prevent people from getting in so that the ones that are in are at least gonna get service. May also not let people who don't look uh, attractive enough in. That may be another <laughs> another job. That's, that doesn't happen with processes. Okay. And then there's the medium term schedule. So we just said that the long term schedule strives, wait, the controls of degree of multi programming. The medium term schedule can be added if the degree of multi programming needs to be decreased. So this is actually some of the long-term schedule. This is kind of what I just described about the long-term schedule, this medium-term schedule. But look what it says here. The, the, the key point here is that he puts them into, removes process from memory, store on disk. In other words, processes by definition are in memory. That's part of the definition. Of, they're actually in memory, right? But if I, with a medium term schedule, may take a process out of memory and put him onto the disk. And that's called virtual memory. When you do such a thing, that's called virtual memory, which virtual memory is simply, without defining exactly how to do it, but virtual memory, the definition of it is, is using um, external memory, exter like hard drives, or uh, yeah, like hard drives, as if it were memory using a storage memory, or put it better, using storage memory as if it were ready memory, as if it were near memory. So I can take a process and put all of his data onto the disk. And now when I wanna run him again, I'll bring him back. And that's kind of like the bouncer also. So swap out, when this, swap out when the CPU cannot allocate enough memory to other processes. So in other words, if, if there's a finite amount of memory and I've got a lot of processes, and I say, well, I can't put more processes in, so I may take a certain process and put it onto the hard drive and leave him there. And at a certain point, the medium term memory might bring him back into the ready queue. But for now, I put him off. Kind of like taking somebody out, really a bouncer, not a doorman, taking somebody who's in the bar and putting him out. It's only temporary. And it's only temporary, yeah. It's not a, the, the, the first one I described was like a doorman. Here is really a bouncer who's walking around the bar and says, uh, you've been here too long, <laughs> get out. Or, or I just have too many people in here. The, the long-term schedule didn't do a good job. Let's just take you out. So what is, so we have swapping in and swapping out. Partially executed swapped out process. So we have a process uh, will be swapped out even though he hasn't finished his execution. Yeah, the error goes like this. It's hard to understand these pictures sometimes. If I'm in the CPU, either I finish, or maybe I don't finish. Maybe I get swapped out, and then I am out on disk. I'm on the disk, and then I go back into the ready queue. Or maybe I asked for uh, I.O., and I went to I.O. waiting, then I also went out of the CPU, and then I got my I.O., and I went back to the ready queue. So here we're showing how this, we're adding this part to the picture that a partially executed job could be swapped out by the medium term scheduler. Where is he swapped out to? To the hard drive. So you see how our definition of process is getting a little bit fuzzy because we said that a process is a program in memory running, but this process is not in memory and it's not running. 
but it's interested in being in memory and interested in running. All right, I want to skip this. I, mean, I, don't, I want to get to more things. But... Well, it does talk about one thing I do want to talk about foreground and background. You can have processes running in the foreground of the background. And, and, and the, I'll just say like this foreground are processes that are using that, that when you click on a mouse, or you um, type something, that process receives that information. It, it's the one that's in focus. The foreground is the process that's running, in, it's in focus. When a process is running in background, it's not in focus, which means that any mouse clicks are going to some other process. But this process is not, is not uh, stagnant, it's running. It's just not running in a way that the user can interface with. That's a background process. Background process is running, but without access to the user until he's brought into the program. And in this slide, it just talks about how uh, I think alternate ways that mobile phones can run their processes. You think about a good example of a, by the way, of a multi-threaded uh, program is a Google browser, right? Uh, or Chrome, Chrome browser has tabs. Each tab is essentially a thread that's running in the process, one program. But it has threads because each you can be downloading on two different uh, threads in your Chrome. So they're running the two different programs. Well, I'm downloading this website and that website. So the two different programs running, but it's one program. So they're threads. Isn't that any browser? Nowadays, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just saying. But the some so that's why I say this. These slides are from like 2000, from like you know almost 10 years ago, and it's talking about some phones that were. Uh, you know, that only let you do one thing at a time. Nowadays, you have multiple processes going, but some of them are in the background. All right. So here, the context switching. We've been talking about context switching a lot, so this slide is kind of uh, repetitious of what we've been saying here. Uh, but it has nice, but it probably phrases it better than I did. Save the state. That's an important concept. Saving state is basically saving the PCB. Everyone knows what I mean. Everyone knows what I mean when I say PCB. Nope. Process control block. Like when it gets switched out. Process control block is all the data, all the information that it describes correctly a process, which includes this. You have to memorize what it what it includes. It includes registers. It includes the program counter. It includes memory limits. There's a slide on it. That is the definition of a process. So, I mean, that's the definition. That is the, essent that's the essential data that a process has. Can you say it can't write in kids? Well, I, I, yeah, registers, all the registers, the program counter, the memory limits. So there's the beginning and ending point of the memory and the process state whether it's running or also the, what, what, the, um, oh, list of open files, thank you, yeah, what else, you have, yeah, there's a slide on it, there's a slide on it, um, but anyway, that's called the state, when it says save the state, that's what that means, save the PCB, so when the CPU switches to another process, the system must save the state of the old process, and load the save state, the PCB, for the new process via a context switch. The context switch of a process represented in the PCB. That's what I said. Context switch time is overhead. We said that already. The time to do the context switch we call overhead. Overhead is a general term to just mean uh, waste, wasted or wasted necessary expense. In other words, like the marginal cost of, of me staying at a hotel is very small. They already have the rooms, they already have the sheets, you know, but there's an overhead. In other words, this is the general expenses of running the whole place divided by all the people. Is, I also should be taken to, to I should, I'm responsible for, in a sense. My, the, when determining the price of a room, you don't just determine the, 
marginal cost, you determine the cost, marginal cost plus the overhead. Anyway, the time, de time dependent on hardware support, right? In other words, if the hardware is faster, it's going to go faster. This, the more complex the operating system and the PCB, the longer, right? The more data I store on a process, the longer the context switch. Therefore, by a, a TCB, a thread, con, a thread control block is smaller than a PCB. So therefore, the context switch between threads is faster because less information is being stored. Right. I, I don't know. Some hardware allows you to load multiple contexts at the same time. Okay. Okay. Processes operate. Great. Like I said, there must be a way to create a process. And we mentioned that the function in Unix is called fork. Um, we have a parent process, a child process. And we can say there's a tree of processes because the parent has a child, a child has a child, there's a grandchild. Oh, it's like the non data structures. Yeah, but it's in time, not in data structures. Static. Here we're talking about in time. Process identification is a PID. Just to understand that. Resource sharing options, parent, parent and child share all resources. People, that's complicated to understand what that means. That's not 100% true. Or, understand what it means. Right. Oh, so there's options. I sorry. They share all resources. They share a subset of resources, or parent and child share no resources. In other words, let's say I create a file. I open a file, and then I create a child. Does the child also have access to the file? So in general, in Unix, yes, it does. And in fact, that would be a method for communication between the two processes. Because the, as long as, but if the father opened the file after he created the child, then they would not have the same. Then they would be, then the child would not have access to the file. In other words, everything the child did, everything the parent did before he created the child, in general, is accessible to the child. But anything he does after he created the child is his, on his own. Now they're on their own. So if I open a file and then I do fork, now the child will be able to access the file and I will be able to access the file. So when can the child not access the file? When the father, when the parent creates the, the file after the fork, after he's created the child. It's kind of like, um, you know what it's like? It's like a haron. What happened with Aaron and the Kohanim? You know this? Who are the Kohanim? His children, but not who? Like, um, not his grandchildren that were alive at the time, right? Me, Mishael. I don't know. Or else, why was it who Pinchas, right? Pinchas was a, Pinchas became a Kohen, right? Greet Shalom. Well, but he was a son, he was a grandson of Aaron. He should have been a Kohen anyway. But why is Hashem making him a Kohen? He was a Kohen. He was a grandson of Aaron. What's the answer? The answer is only his sons and he became Kohen, I believe, right? And his grandsons not. And and, and Pinchas was a grandson. And he raises not. But after, in other words, any once they were appointed Kohanim, now their grands, now the grandsons would become. But any grandson that Pat was around before the appointment wouldn't become a Kohen. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So therefore, if he really wasn't a Kohen, then he became a Kohen. But I think it's the same thing. The pro, anything that the father, it's sort of the opposite, actually. Anything that the father does after he created the children, so the children don't inherit. So then only inherit what he did before he, he created them. But anything that he did before he created them, they inherit. After he created them, now he's on his own. The father has gone off. He's abandoned his children. Anyway, the comparison is not exactly perfect. Uh, this is this tree of processes. Not that important. 
But you see that processes can make parents, parents can make children. Okay, so this is in Unix, you know, you could do a fork. And then, I mean, this is a, just a classic example of a, of a parent making a child. Here, this is how the shell works. I don't know why exactly the slide is here, but I can, but it's interesting to understand. Make a fork, then the parent just waits. What does he wait for? He's waiting for the child to do something. The child does execute. Execute, run some other command. Maybe the parents waiting for the child to execute. Yes. In other words, uh, what would be a good command? I don't know. You want to? There's a there's a pre there's a there's a. I really have to show you in the lab. I'll show you this in the lab. Remind me somebody to show you this in the lab. But the idea is that the parent doesn't want to do this execute because this execute actually. Uh, replaces the parent's memory space with the new program. If, if the parent would do execute on something, in other words, saying execute means run some other function, some other program, other program. If, I, if the parent would say run some other program, then now the parent's gone. The other program is running. His process has been replaced. Fine, let's go. Two slides ago, I said that the research option that you yeah, I would, I would just say theoretically there, are, and I explained what the normal behavior would be. Theoretically, they could not share any resources. And also execution options. Parent and children execute concurrently. Parent waits until the child terminates. There's two possibilities. Are they run simultaneously or not simultaneously? There should be no resources when the child So I said that in, in general, the normal thing is that they, the, the the resources that the father creates after he created the child are not shared. But the resources that he created before he created the child, and then he goes and creates a child, so the child has those resources. Are we having a break? Yeah, we have a break. Yeah, so let's uh, have a break. Yeah, we had a break. Yeah. So till eleven. Uh, yeah. I want to get this slide before. Okay, so let me stop recording.